Conceptually, you now know how a computer functions. But what does it look like to you, the user, when you're sitting in front of a computer screen? When you first turn on a computer called booting a computer, it takes a while for all the gizmos and electronics to get themselves up and running. <laughs> but once everything is finished, you'll be presented with an image on the computer monitor called the desktop. Now, just like a desktop in our real physical world, the virtual digital world of a computer desktop is the foundational environment of how your computer functions. This basic opening realm is called your operating system, or OS. And just like there are different brands of computers, there are different operating systems. The most popular and common operating systems are Microsoft Windows and Unix. Apple, Mac OS, and Linux are common operating systems based upon a Unix foundation. Now your operating system is also a form of software. So you remember my, my garage analogy, okay? So think of the operating system like the floor of the garage and the paint on the walls. The operating system is not the garage itself, but all your software inside the garage is running inside of that operating system. If you take out the floor of your garage, well, there's no foundation to install anything upon. So, for the purpose of teaching these videos, I'm going to show you the Microsoft Windows operating system. Now, I also have an Apple Mac OS operating system, but just to keep things consistent, we'll stick with Windows. And besides, as a matter of personal preference, I like editing video projects on my Apple Mac OS, but I prefer Windows for web development. So, you might not have Windows on your computer, you might have a different operating system, but everything I'm gonna teach you, it's like, it's like learning to drive a car. You know, the vehicle you use in your driver's class probably isn't identical to your family car, but once you learn to drive, they're all pretty similar. So computers are the same. They might have different operating systems, but their general functionality is still the same. Once you learn basic functionality on Windows, it transfers easily to Apple, Mac OS, and other popular operating systems. Now, depending upon how they're configured, some computers will require you to set up a username and password to access the system. Now, these are rather self-explanatory terms. <laughs> you are the user of the computer, and the computer wants to identify you with a unique name. And a password is just like a secret password to get into a treehouse. The only difference is you type it instead of whispering it through a door. <laughs> and the reason that you want to identify your own personal account on a computer system with usernames and passwords, is be it, that's useful in cases where a single computer might be used by multiple people, and you want to keep your data isolated from other users. For example, if you have a family computer with multiple family members using it, or a school computer with multiple students using the same system, you create an account in the operating system to personalize the OS for yourself. So, once we have a desktop up and running, there are 11 basic skills I want to show you. So the first batch focuses on the operating system itself, the second focuses on programs, and the third explains the fundamentals of working with files. So in other words, I want to give you a tour of the garage before I show you how to use the tools. <laughs> So section one is using the operating system. It's how to navigate around the monitor, how to create and organize folders, how to turn on file extensions. Section two is using programs, how to start and stop programs, what is crashing. Section three is opening and saving files, how to open and read files, what is a corrupt file, how to save and write files, how to close files, how to copy or duplicate files and folders, and how to erase files and folders. Once I explain all those things, you should be able to sit down at any computer and at least open and save files. <laughs> 
Before we get started, there's one thing I want to go over really quickly, and that is that you should watch all of these videos on a desktop computer at 1920 by 1080 resolution in full screen mode. Now I know if you're brand new to computers, you have no idea what I'm talking about, okay? But let me show you really quickly. So if you right click on the desktop in Windows, you'll see something like this, screen resolution, and you'll see an interface like this where it says resolution 1920 by 1080, and here's some smaller resolutions as well. So make sure you're at 1920 by 1080. And you wanna watch this on a desktop computer. You don't wanna look at it on a smartphone or a tablet because the text will just be too darn small to read. And then when you're in YouTube, right, you're watching a video in here, you wanna watch this full screen. And you do that by coming down here to this little square and you see it says full screen. If I click that, now the video is in full screen presentation. And to come back out of it, I just click this where it says exit full screen. So that's what you need to do with all these videos. Watch them full screen, 1920 by 1080 on a desktop, and that will be the optimal viewing experience. When you're on the desktop of your computer or any program, you'll see a small indicator on your screen, usually in the shape of an arrow called a cursor. And you can move and navigate the cursor around the virtual world of your computer screen by moving and sliding your mouse across your desk in the real world. The mouse is a unique piece of hardware containing a light sensor and buttons which allow you to activate the cursor. Now the look and design of the cursor changes in different programs, but the basic concept remains the same. It is an indicator to let you know which specific coordinates of the screen you are interacting with. For example, as you navigate around the operating system, the cursor appears as an arrow. But when you navigate inside of a drawing program, it might appear like a paintbrush or a circle. And if you navigate inside of a say a writing program, well then the cursor appears as a little carrot to let you know which part of the screen you're gonna be typing on. So moving this cursor on the screen and clicking the buttons on your mouse allows you to open files and to launch programs and to control programs. And typically, opening a file is as simple as moving the cursor on top of the file and quickly clicking the left mouse button two times. And this action is called a double click. For example, on this logo, if I double click and then we go back to the drawing program, you'll see the logo appears in the drawing program. Your files are represented by little pictures called icons with names beneath them. And the size of your icons can also be increased or decreased. So if you come up here to view, you could go down to medium icons or small icons, or maybe you just want to view it in a list, and you can change it to that as well. So if you have really great vision or you tend to work really close to your monitor, uh, you might want smaller icons. If you sit far away or you have poorer vision, well, then you might want larger icons. And you'll also notice that your mouse has a right-hand button. Now, when you hover your cursor over an icon, and you click the right hand button a single time, a menu of options will appear. Now, I'm not gonna explain every nuance of these little menus and all the options, but I want to make sure that you're familiar with the fundamental principles of cursors, icons, double clicking, and right clicking. So that way when I say click on such and such or right click and copy the file, you'll understand what I'm asking you to do. Now, bordering the top of the screen, or sometimes the bottom, is a section called a taskbar. And this shows you what programs and folders you have open. Now, the default location for the taskbar is the bottom of the screen. But you can click and drag the taskbar and move it to the top. So click and drag means click the left-hand mouse button. And while you're holding the mouse button down, you slide the mouse and drag the item across the screen, like so. So you can drag it to the bottom, you can drag it to the side, or you can keep it on the top. Now the taskbar allows you to start up software by clicking on all these little icons. There's a collapsible menu, a little button, 
in the taskbar right here labeled Start. And that gives you access to every single program and hard drive on your computer system. And if you pause with your cursor over a menu item, a little yellow pop-up window appears and it tells you what that item controls. So that's a very basic rundown of how to navigate around the system using the mouse and the cursor. Now, years ago when computers were first invented, every interaction with the system was done by typing commands on the keyboard. And this was frequently called a command prompt. Now the command prompt is still available in most operating systems today, but the command prompt is rarely used because the mouse and the icon interface made operating computers much, much easier. So this dynamically expanding and contracting field of folders and programs became known as Windows. And this entire design principle was called a graphical user interface, or GUI, pronounced GUI. Inside this digital world, your files are organized into folders, just like they would be in filing cabinets in the real world. And you can name these folders anything you want, and you can even nest folders within folders, within folders, as many levels as you desire. And this allows you to keep your computer extremely personal and organized. So as an example, you might keep folders for legal documents, another for family photos, another for recordings of music, and another for movies. So let's create some new folders from scratch as a way to illustrate that concept. So here on the desktop, if I just right click and I come down to new, I can choose folder and there the folder appears and I can name it anything I want. So let's pretend we're gonna put vacation photos in there. So we call it vacation. And then if I double click on the folder, it takes me inside what is within the folder. Now one of the most important things to understand about computers, and one tip that will make them far less intimidating, is that there are often multiple ways to accomplish the same task. For example, to create a new folder, there are a number of ways you can do it. You can open an existing folder, like we just did here, and we click this button that says new folder, right? You can also right click and select new folder. It creates another one. You can also go up here to file, new, <laughs> folder, and that's another way to make one. And the fourth way that you could make a new folder is to use the keyboard shortcut of control shift N. So what's a keyboard shortcut? A keyboard shortcut is the process of hitting multiple keys simultaneously to tell your computer to do a particular function. So in this case, when you see control shift N, it means while you're holding down the control and shift key, you tap the N key and a new folder is created. Now you'll notice as soon as you create the folder that the name is highlighted and that lets you know that you can type a name on the keyboard and rename the folder. So as I said, let's pretend that we're gonna create some uh, vacation photo folders, right? So here we've got a bunch of folders now that we already created. Now we could just rename the ones that we have, right? So maybe we'll say uh, we're gonna have Florida pictures in there. We're gonna have Ohio pictures in there. And we're gonna have California pictures in that one. And maybe we'll have Arizona pictures in that one, right? So you can name them whatever you want. And then inside of these folders, you could start to save images from your camera. Now that's not something I'm gonna demonstrate because every camera could be different. I just am using that as an example. But you know, maybe you want an even more detailed folder structure, right? Maybe inside of here, inside of Ohio, you'll wanna create, you know, a Columbus folder. And then maybe you'll want to have a a Cleveland folder you know I mean you don't have to you could just do it that way if you want you could maybe organize the folders by year so you could start to create years inside here or maybe within vacation you might want to say well okay let's put in all of our all of our 2019 photos are all going to go in here and then we can just click and drag those inside 2019 and now if I double click 2019, you can see all those states have been moved inside. So 
you know, in order to navigate through all these layers of folders, you don't have to click on the folders all the time either. There's also a thing called a file path, which is right up in here. And it's also called a directory structure. And it's just another way to move back and forth through folders that you have visited. You can also use this right here, this back button, and that will navigate you back through the path. Or if I hit the forward button, that takes me back to the folder I was in. And then I can click on anything here in the path. So I could click on vacation to take me back to that. I could click on 2019 to take me into that. So whatever you want, there's a lot of different ways to navigate the system. It's all up to you. This, this is your world. <laughs> you can customize your folders in whatever the way is the most conducive to the way you like to keep things organized. Speaking of organizational tips, one good tip I always suggest is to keep your operating system and your programs on one hard drive and all of your project files on another hard drive. So for example, if we click up here on the computer icon, that shows us all the drives that are in the system. And for mine, you can see that I have my main hard drive, and then I also have some storage drives as well. So why is this a good idea? Well, because sometimes a hard drive will malfunction, and you can no longer access data on that drive. So imagine if you only have one hard drive on your computer and it malfunctions, then you'll lose everything. But if you have two hard drives, one that has the operating system and one storing your files, and let's say you lose one of these storage drives, well, at least the computer is still running, and so you might even be able to salvage whatever is on the storage drive. If you have two hard drives and you lose the operating system drive, well, at least you haven't lost any of your data, right? So at worst, you might just have to reinstall your operating system and your programs. You know, you might end up losing a whole day of work in that process, but it's sure better than losing months of work if your storage drive dies out on you. So that's why you should always have at least two drives on your computer, one that holds your operating system and programs, and another that holds your files. Now, one thing I've not explained about hard drives, you can have physical hard drives and virtual hard drives. So what's the difference? Well, physical hard drives are actual physical pieces of hardware, and virtual drives use the operating system to create different sections of your drive called partitions. So for example, these two drives right here are actual physical drives, but these three drives are virtual drives. So there's only one physical drive and it's divided up into three partitions. The partitions function as if they were separate physical pieces of hardware, even though they're still on the same physical drive. So again, the whole purpose of this is just to protect yourself in the event of a hard drive failure. And in case you're wondering, yes, <laughs> This actually did save me once or twice over the years. My operating system was damaged. I had no way to fix it, short of completely erasing and reinstalling everything. And thankfully, my storage drive was not damaged. So I wiped out the OS and I put it back. And the process took a whole day, but at least none of my important files were lost or damaged in the process. So now back to talking about folders. So you'll notice that every window in the upper right has uh, three same buttons right here, right? And those are known as minimize, maximize, and close. So the minimize button, if you click that, it shrinks the window down into your taskbar, okay? Now the center button, the maximize, if you click that, then your entire screen fills with that window. And if you click maximize again, it restores it back down to the way that it was. And the right hand close button, pretty obvious, <laughs> that one closes the window. Now, you'll notice if you're in a program, the program has the exact same buttons. So you can shut down a program in the same way. Now, while we're on the subject of shrinking and expanding the size of a window, I should also mention that you can manually click and drag the corners of a window or the perimeter lines and you can resize windows that way as well. So another important concept behind the whole click and drag thing, or just drag as it's often called, is not only do you use click and drag to move the taskbar or change the size of a window, but you can also use it to move files 
from one folder into another. So you click on the file with the left mouse button and continue to hold down the button as I showed you when I was doing things in the vacation folder and you slide and drag the folders into a different location. And finally, I should probably also explain the concept of a shortcut file. So shortcuts are exactly what they sound like. They're files which point to other files, okay? So why would you need a shortcut? Well, because sometimes you might have a file that you need access to very frequently, but it's buried far inside of multiple folders, right? So let's say, for example, I have my, my backup drive or my, um, well, let's see here. Um, well, all of these icons here down the side are actually shortcuts. You can see with the little, they have the little arrow on them. So that lets you know that it's not the actual item, but it's a shortcut to the item. So I could come into computer and then I could come into my main hard drive or I can also just click on the shortcut and that takes me to the main hard drive as well. And the way that you create a shortcut is you simply right click on the item you want to make a shortcut for and go to create shortcut. And that will create the shortcut in the same folder and then you can move it wherever you want. You can click and drag it to any, any location you desire. So <laughs> I know that was a lot. But now, look, you know how to create folders. You know how to use file paths. You can minimize, maximize, and close windows and programs. You can alter the size of a window. You can move files and folders to different locations. And you know how to make shortcuts. Why am I spending all this time teaching you folders and storage locations? About 23 years ago, 1996, I was helping a woman to upgrade Photoshop which is a popular photo editing program. And before I installed the new version, I wanted to remove or uninstall the old version. Now, this is always a common practice, just to assure you don't get any weird behavior in the program in case the new version tries to communicate with old files and whatnot. So I asked this woman about four or five times if she was okay with me removing her old Photoshop folder. Is that okay? Do you have all your working files saved in another location? Are you sure you want me to remove the old Photoshop? I can delete this folder now. <clears throat> You're ready for me to erase it. Yep. Yep, she was ready. Well, I deleted it. And sure enough, when she opened the new version of Photoshop, she asked, where are all my picture files on my projects? They were in my Photoshop folder. <laughs> what? I asked five times to delete your old Photoshop folder, and you said yes every single time. She lost everything that she had been working on. And I felt terrible about it. But at the same time, <laughs> I didn't feel that terrible because I asked her for confirmation multiple times. It wasn't my fault. She was uneducated and ignorant about where she was saving her files. That is a prime example of people who do not understand how their computer functions, where their files are being saved, or how the file structure of their computer works. Because she lacked a basic understanding of her computer system, she didn't fully comprehend the implications of what I was asking her. Please, don't be one of those people. Ask for clarification. Learn how files and folders work. Know where you are saving your stuff. Understand, these locations are not magical, arbitrary things. They possess tangible paths they are consistent places. If you had a huge room in your house filled with 900 filing cabinets, you wouldn't randomly stuff papers in unlabeled drawers. So don't do that on your computer either. Become familiar with where you are saving things. 
So you'll remember in a past article I mentioned that not all programs can open all file types. Well, all files have a three-letter suffix at the end of their name, which tells the computer the type of file it happens to be. So you can see right here, this one has .gif, this is .png, this one is .jpg. Now this suffix is called a file extension, and the Windows operating system installs with these letters being invisible. Now I like to make sure my file extensions are visible because it allows me to see at a glance what type of file I'm working with. So the way to turn the file extensions on is really simple. You just open up any folder, you come up here to Tools, and then you go to Folder Options, and then under View, you make sure that you uncheck this, which is Hide Extensions for Known File Types. Now I can give you a perfect example of why this would be important. So let's say, let's, let's just turn them, let's turn them off again, just for a moment. So we'll say hide, and now you can see all those file names, they don't have the extension anymore, right? And here we can turn them back on. So why is this so important? Well, let's say you're developing a website, okay? And images and pictures on a computer can be saved in a ton of different file formats. The file format is the way the code is stored for that file, and not all programs are able to read all file formats. For example, digital cameras can save images in multiple file formats. One is this, one is a JPEG, another one is a CRW, and those are called RAW images. Now, even though JPEGs and RAW images both came from the same camera, not all image editing programs can open or understand both of those file formats. Some of the more simplistic image editing programs might only be able to open this JPEG and they can't handle the raw file. But that doesn't just apply to images. Even programs used to write text and code can save files in multiple formats. For example, uh, some text files here on a website, you know, they can be PHP files. They could be, if we come into here, an XML file, right? And even though those files all contain text and words, not all word processing or text editing programs can open all the files. So that's why knowing your file format is extremely important. So browsers can only, only display about three or four different formats of image files, namely JPEGs, uh, GIFs, PNGs, and SVGs. So Suppose you create an image for your website and you accidentally save it in the wrong file format, such as a TIFF file. So when you try to load your web page, that picture you created just doesn't show up. And if you have your file extensions turned off, well, it might take you a while to figure out what the problem is, but if they're turned on, you'll probably spot that mistake immediately. With file extensions turned off, it could take you a while to figure out that problem. This is why I always run a computer system with file extensions turned on. Now, millions of people use computers for years and never turn on their extensions. I have no idea how they keep organized or work with any efficiency because it's so much easier to glance at file names and immediately know what they are. Programs can be started a few different ways. So, First, you could double-click on a file type that's associated with that program. You can go to the Start menu and select the program from the menu. You could put a shortcut on the taskbar or on your desktop and click on that. Or you could navigate to the Programs folder on your C drive and click on the .exe file of that program. So, let's use the double-click method. Right? If I double-click on this logo, you'll see it starts up Photoshop and there it is. So there's no right or wrong way to start a program. I mean, these four different options are all a matter of personal preference. I personally use all four of those methods. <laughs> and with programs I use a lot, you know, sometimes I'll double click on a file. Um, usually I'll start it from the taskbar up on top. And if I rarely use the program, I might not even keep shortcuts for it. So I'll have to navigate to it directly. So when you play music on your stereo system or watch a home movie on your television or run a table saw in your garage, you have to do a few steps to get that tool working. You know, you have to push some buttons or engage some switches. The same thing applies to using a computer program. You have to do a few steps to get your software up and running. 
and there are many interchangeable terms for starting up a computer program, such as loading, open, run, or launch. So for example, if you're using a program to record music, the first thing an instructor might say is load a music program, or open the music editor, or run your music software, or launch the music software. All of those phrases mean the same thing. You're being asked to start up the music program. Now as for stopping a program, there are multiple ways to do that as well. When you want to stop running an electrical tool in your garage, it typically has an on-off switch. When you stop running a computer program, you typically need to instruct the computer to quit or exit the program. So one way you can do it is to go to the upper right and click the close button, as we discussed before. You can also come over here to file, exit, and that will also stop running the program. Or you can use a keyboard shortcut, and here you can see it actually tells you that control Q is the keyboard shortcut to shut down Photoshop. What is crashing? Sometimes a program might stop working all by itself. Computers are very complicated things, and on occasion, something might go wrong as it's calculating something, and the next thing you know, your program just vanishes, and you're back on your desktop. You didn't quit, you didn't exit, the program is just gone. Poof, it's vanished. Now, thankfully, this doesn't happen often. And if it does happen often, your computer has some serious problems. <laughs> but when it does occur, this phenomenon is known as crashing. Now, sometimes you might be working in a program and instead of crashing, everything locks up. Your cursor won't move, you can't type anything. This is known as a computer freezing. Now, there are times when a computer might recover from a freeze. If you wait a few seconds, Sometimes the problem will fix itself. But when a program decides to crash, you're pretty much done for. <laughs> now, some people use the terms crash and freeze interchangeably. Technically, they are different, but it's not that important. If a program crashes, usually you can just restart it. If a program freezes and locks up your whole operating system, you may just have to reboot or restart the system by physically turning your power switch on and off. Either word means you just lost your work. <laughs> so hopefully you recently saved your files before the system froze or crashed. Now, speaking of saving files, there are three options to open or read a file. You can double click on it. You can click and drag the file into an open program window or you can navigate to the open dialog box in the program that you're using. So anytime you want to open a file from inside, you would come up to here, you'd go to File, Open, and then you're presented with this interface, which is called a dialog box. And then, for example, I could click on the Made in USA, and it opens up that file inside this program. And the other way that you can get to the open dialog is instead of clicking on file open, you can also use the keyboard shortcut of control zero, or I'm sorry, control O. <laughs> Big difference between zero and O. Control O and that will open up the open dialog. So you remember when I said that the lawyers at Disney had no idea how to open a file in a text editing program? Well, this is what they never used. They never used an open dialog box. They would always double click on a file instead. And most of the time, if the program associated with that file is not running, then double clicking on the file will launch the associated program and open the file in that. So you don't necessarily need to manually launch a program before you open the file. And this is why the lawyers at Disney were perplexed, because when they tried to open a web page file, they would double click and it would launch a browser. So we need to edit and alter the code of a web page in a text editing program. So since the file type of a web page is associated with a web browser, you have to open it in a text editor with an open dialog. If you double click it, then your browser will launch instead. For example, let's say we're looking at these basic HTML pages that we're using for these lessons. If I double click on this file, it opens up in a web browser. Well, that's not what we want if we're trying to edit the file. 
So we have to open it up in a text editor by coming over to File, Open. We get to the exact same file through the Open dialog. Double click that. And now we have opened that HTML file in a text editor. What is a corrupt file? Sometimes things can go wrong when you're copying or saving files. Maybe there's a power surge just at the moment the file is being saved, or maybe the program crashes or freezes. When things like this happen, sometimes your files can get corrupted. A corrupted file is just another word for a file that's been damaged in some way. Now, occasionally, programs are able to salvage corrupted files, but in a majority of the cases of file corruption, you're never able to open that file again. This is why it's so important to make copies or backups of your work. If you're diligent about making backups, then at worst, you might only lose a few hours of work. For example, when I'm writing a new novel, I never create my entire book in one file. Instead, I write each chapter as its own file. That way, if a file happens to get damaged or corrupted, I've only lost one chapter in my book instead of losing the entire thing. Now, file corruption is a very rare thing. I mean, with the thousands of files I've created in my life, I've almost never had a file get corrupted. I've had maybe, maybe half a dozen out of thousands. Nevertheless, it's good to be aware of the danger and to make sure you make backup copies of your vital files just in case. There's really only one way to save files in most programs, and that is by using the Save dialog box, which looks identical to the Open dialog box, which is right here. You can also use Save As if you want to save a duplicate of that file under a different name. So you would come here to Save As. As you can see, the, the box looks exactly the same, but now you're going to type in a file name for whatever this new file is that you want to save and you would say okay logo new file click save it gives you some options sometimes for Photoshop things and then that's it and now you've resaved this file the way that you close files you can usually close a file in about three like three different ways you can either click the close button on the file window or you could come up under file and select close or you can use the keyboard shortcut of control w so how can i copy or duplicate files and folders well you can see here the new file that i had created so one way i can make a copy of this is to right click and come down to copy and then, wherever I want to place that file, I can paste it. So, for example, even over here on the desktop, if I right-click and then select Paste, there is a copy of that file. Another way that you can copy a file or a folder is to select it and use a keyboard shortcut of Control-C for copy and then Control-V for paste. So, since I'm in the same folder, if I hit Control-V, now you see a copy of that file will appear. So how do I get rid of these files? How do I erase files from the computer? Well, again, there's a couple different ways you could do that. I could select the file, and then I could come up to File, Delete, and get rid of it that way. And it'll ask for confirmation. Am I sure I want to move it to the recycle bin? And click Yes. I could also just right click on the file and say delete and click yes. And then over here, I'll actually just hit the delete button on the keyboard and it does the same thing. So you'll notice it's always asking if I want to move the file to the recycle bin. Now, this is an important thing to understand that when you delete files, they're not actually erased. They're all put into a special folder called the Recycle Bin, which you can see down here in the lower right. Now, if I double click on the Recycle Bin, you can see all the files that I had put in there. 
So the files aren't actually erased. They're just basically sitting in this special folder. So in order to actually erase them, you have to right click on the recycle bin and select empty recycle bin. And you'll notice that right now the image of the icon has some papers in it. And once I select empty recycle bin, those papers will disappear. Now those files have actually been deleted. That about covers the basics of computers and how they function. So I hope that was helpful and informative. So now when I tell you to download and install a specific software program or open a file using the open dialog or copy and paste a line of code, you should know exactly what I'm talking about. Now I understand <laughs> this was a lot of information and a lot to take in, but if you didn't follow it or you're still confused, just watch the video again and read the article on the website. You know, take some notes. You should start to grasp all of it in due time. Just be patient with yourself, you know? There was once a time in my life when I didn't know any of this. And I sat transfixed in front of a television screen completely baffled by how video games worked, <laughs> you know? So you will understand this stuff eventually. Like I said, just review it again, give yourself some time, and you'll figure it out. Thank you so much for watching, and remember kids, the world owes you nothing until you create things of value.